Amen. One of the things that I've learned to enjoy after, since having children is listening to a child pray. When you listen to children pray, it's really great until it's time to eat, right? Because when they're young and they're praying, I, I love watching our kids because, and any kid because what they'll do is they'll fold their hands and they'll bow their head and, and then they'll close their eyes and if they're saying the prayer, they'll start praying. But then you start seeing one eye open right after they run out of things to pray for, which essentially is dear God, right? So they open their eye and then at least in our household how it goes is thank you for mommy, thank you for daddy, thank you for sister, thank you for the doggy, thank you for my food, for the chicken nuggets, for the table. And then there's always that pause where you think they're done. You're like, okay, and they, then they start again. Thank you for the TV. Thank you for the carpet. And in our household, we all say, all right, honey, God knows you're thankful. Time to wrap this thing up. <laughs> amen. And, okay, amen. But I, I love watching them pray because they're thankful and they have an attitude that I believe we can learn from and that is how thankful they are for everything. And I, whenever you're trying to eat and your food's getting cold and they're thanking God for every single little hair on their arm or something like that, we get impatient but we forget that's really some of the thankfulness God wants us to have. That's really what we've been called to do. And last week we talked about this idea of having a thankful uh, heart and how do we cultivate that. And as we continue through our series this, not quarter, this month, on being thankful, I want to continue with being thankful for who God is, not just what He has done. You see, we often discuss being thankful for what God does. But how often do we share with Him how thankful we are for who He is? And so this morning, we're going to discuss this idea. We're going to talk about some of God's attributes, if you will, that I personally am thankful for. And I believe in Scripture, we're going to see others who are thankful for these attributes. The first thing that I'm thankful for is I'm thankful for the love of God. I'm thankful for the love of God. The love of God is wonderful. It's vast. It's great. It's deeper than anything we could ever imagine. I always believed that I knew how much God loved me. And I always believed what it meant to have that unconditional love. And then I had children. And I realized I didn't know what true love was. No offense, honey. I didn't know what it meant to have the love of God. And then my one particular child started get, getting a few years older, and I learned how in spite of the love God has, the incredible frustration God can have with us. As we talked about in Bo's class this morning. And then... As that child continues to get older, I'm reminded of, in spite of the love that we have, I, I am very aware now of why God wanted to annihilate an entire group of people from time to time. It's not because He doesn't love. It's because He does love. See, God's love is great. I'm thankful for how much God loves me in spite of my lack of love for Him from time to time and what I show and demonstrate to Him. I'm, ha I'm excited and I'm thankful for the love of God that He has in spite of whether I deserve His love or not. He loves me and He loves me without condition. It doesn't say God will love you if you do anything. He says God loves you over and over in Scripture. It says God loves you. Now you're not saved until if you do something. But no matter how far you go, God loves you. No matter how much you sin, God loves you. Two things to know about God's love that I'm thankful for is that His love is great and that His love is unwavering. We sing a song, How Great is Our God. 
And he's great in his love. John 3, 16 through 18 demonstrates how great God's love is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His love was so great that he gave up his only, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God of the only Son of God. Now, we often hear this, and I've often preached this as being centered around the believe in God, right? And then here's what belief looks like. But the truth is, I believe in John's Gospel, especially in this instance, but all throughout it, we see an emphasis on the love that God has. If you read this and you only see whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life, if you read that and that's all you see, you've missed the key component. You've missed what it's saying. It's God loved us so much. This is less about belief in God and, and that leading to salvation. And that's a whole other discussion for another sermon. This is primarily about love of God and belief in God's love. God loved us. The world. Not just Christians, not just those who sit in here, not just those who go to church, not just those who do everything He says. He loves them, but He loved the world. He loved the sinners. He loved the heathen, if you will. He loved the people who hate Him. He loves those who hate Him so much that He sent the Son to come and to die on a cross so that those who turn to Him, who believe in Christ who turned towards God that they can have an opportunity for eternal life. God's love is great. Because when we don't deserve it, He still gives it. He has a great love. God's love is so great that He gave up His Son not to condemn, but to save. There's Scripture throughout Scripture that says that God desires that all humanity is saved. Not just those who are already Christian, but everyone is saved. And we're going to get into this in a few moments, but the truth is God's love is so great. But it's not just great, it's unwavering. I get tired of hearing about love today. Oh, I'm in love with so-and-so. And And it's that fair-weather love, right? I'm in love with so-and-so as long as fill in the blank. And see, we do this with God often too. We say, God, I love you. I'm going to follow you as long as you give me what I want in life. As long as you do whatever it might be. I love the church I attend to. As long as it does what I want. Who cares about the other people, right? I love brother or sister so-and-so as long as they're not a pain in the neck. Right? Isn't it great that God is unwavering in His love? He doesn't say that with us. He loves us. He loves us. Did you know God loves us so much that He doesn't condemn any one of us? Now, he, we condemn ourselves by what we do, right? But God loves us that He gave us the opportunity to be part of His family. God loves us no matter what. Psalm 37, 36, I'm sorry, the first part of verse 7 says, How precious is your steadfast love, O God. And again, the psalmist writes in 136, verse 26, Give thanks to the God of heaven for His steadfast love endures forever. I am so thankful for the love of God. Connected with that love, I'm also thankful for the patience of God. I'm also thankful that God is a patient God. One of His attributes is patience. Because I am often anything but patient. 
I love that God is patient with me, even whenever I'm driving him crazy. In Psalm 103, verse 8, we read, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He's slow to anger. He is patient with each and every one of us. He is patient with the non-Christian. He is patient with the person who says God doesn't exist. He is patient with the person who wants nothing to do with God. He is patient. And by the way, His patience is because of His love for all of humanity. We have a God who is patient. We serve a God who is patient with you and I. And hopefully we all realize, God, that, that there are moments in our life where God has to be patient with us because of who we are. He is slow to anger. He's merciful because of that patience. He's patient with us that we don't get what we deserve right then, right now. The prophet Joel ties God's patience in with his love for us. In Joel chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, we read, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. In other words, Joel is saying, Turn to God because He is being patient with you, and that's why He's slow to anger. And He doesn't want you to face disaster. Verse 14, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offered for the Lord your God. Peter seconds what Joel says, but then says it is not only out of love, but it is out of his hopefulness. Our God is a hopeful God. He's, a positive, he's got a positive mindset most of the time, if not all the time. Second Peter, verse 9 of chapter 3 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Why is God patient? He loves us so much that He wants all of us, everyone in this room and everyone out of this room, to turn to Him. By the way, don't don't confuse God's patience with God's permission. Don't confuse God's patience with God's permission. We serve a God that is so optimistic and hopeful about humanity that He is patient and is dealing with us. Why is God optimistic? Because God knows us. He created us. God doesn't create imperfect things. Now, imper now perfect things can become imperfect. That's what we're all... Right? That, that's the boat we're all in. But when God created Adam and then God created Eve and God created this world, God did not just stand back. Contrary to popular belief, He didn't stand back and look at Adam and go, oh, I can do better than this. What does God say? He creates and He says, it is not just good, but when it's humanity, what does He say? Very good. A.K.A. it's exactly the way I want it. Isn't that amazing? You are exactly the way God wants you. Not in your sinfulness. I'm not talking about that. But God loves us and He's patient with us because He knows our potential. He knows what we can do with Him in our lives. I am thankful for God's love and His patience. However, I am also and especially thankful for God's salvation that He offers us. Now, salvation is kind of a two-part thing. We can be thankful for the salvation, like I just said, that He offers us. But God is not offering only salvation. God is in and of Himself salvation, isn't He? It's made clear throughout Scripture. We're, we're pulling a lot from Psalms this morning, so we're going to move into a different verse here in a moment. But in the Psalms, it's very clear that God is in and of Himself salvation, the essence of God. When God interacts with people, it is salvation whenever God decides salvation is appropriate. It is a characteristic of God. Why? Because evil can have nothing to do with Him. Just as Satan is 
the essence of evil. God is the essence of good. Satan is the essence of failing and falling and sinning. God is the essence of salvation and living and life. Habakkuk. We just went through Habakkuk recently, but verse 3 I'm sorry, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail in the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. By the way, if you don't remember what's going on in the time of Habakkuk, Habakkuk cries out in the first few chapters for God and says, God, don't you see the injustices happening among your people that they're whole, they're, they're not holy, they're, they're sinful. They're devoted to nothing that is good. Don't you understand that? Don't you see that? And, and God says, it hasn't gone unnoticed. I'm bringing the Chaldeans. And, and Habakkuk says, what? The Chaldeans? Don't you know how horrible of a people they are? And God says, I do. And they're going to destroy Judah for the sin that Judah has done. And here Habakkuk says, though the days look dark, look what he says in verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is able to offer salvation because he is salvation. Notice that Habakkuk will have joy even in the midst of uncertainty as his world falls apart around them because God is a God of salvation. Earlier we read in John 3, 16 through 18 that God is concerned with our salvation, not with our damnation. And I think that's important. Often, if all you ever tell about God to other people is how he's condemning their sin and he's condemning them, then God is concerned in their eyes with their damnation. But if all you do is, not all you do, but if what you predominantly do is tell them about God's love and about how God wants to give salvation to them and how God is patient with them because of that love and desire to give them salvation, then you're helping them understand that God is concerned not with their damnation, but with their salvation. And there's a big difference in that, isn't there? There's a big difference. One produces someone who comes to Christ because they're terrified and they have a greater percentage chance of falling away when they learn, oh, God's very scary, but I made an emotional response, not an actual response. The other side produces people who understand that God can be scary when God's mad. But they understand that same power leads to salvation. That's more powerful than anything Satan can throw at us, right? Do not be afraid of those in this world who can do harm to you. Why? Because God is a God of salvation. God desires that all are saved through His Son. Of the many attributes of God I am thankful for, and these are only a few of them, I find myself often gravitating towards His love, His patience, and His salvation. Now, this isn't all of them. We're going to talk about more of them tonight. But... These three that we talked about, I want to illustrate. I'm, I'm not the only one who's thankful for who God is beyond just what he does. Peter and John are taken before the Jewish high council and threatened not to speak about the saving power of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. We see Peter's bold response to this. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter was so thankful for who God is and what he had done in Christ that he could not help but proclaim the salvation of God and proclaim the love of God and the patience of God, if you will, and proclaim who God is to all, even when threatened not to do so. Are we so thankful, not just for what God has done, but for who He is, that we declare who God is to the masses? Are we so thankful that we treat God and our love for God 
as if we won the lottery where we go tell anyone and everyone we possibly can about let me tell you about not my God, but about the God in heaven. Because the God, not my God, the God is a God who is a God of love. The God is a God who is a God of love that loved us so much that he gave Jesus so that we can be saved, so that we can find his salvation. And he is so patient with us because of that love and because that he desires to save not just me, but all of us. That's the God I want to talk about. That's the God that I want to share about. That's the God the world needs to hear from each and every one of us. Are we as excited about who God is as we are as what God has done? When we get real excited about who He is, it's amazing how it changes and shapes our everyday life, our everyday interaction, not just our prayers, but it permeates the entirety of our life. This morning, we've talked about only three of the many characteristics of God that I'm thankful for. But to show gratitude to God, we must not only discuss what we are thankful for, we must take action. One of the ways we take action, if you're a non-Christian, is you have to accept the salvation. You have to accept the gift. You have to accept the love. We talked about John 3.16, whoever believes in Him will not perish but have it. Uh, everlasting life. It gives the opportunity, Acts 2.38, whenever uh, Peter tells them what happened and who Jesus was and who God is. Notice they, they responded to who Christ was and God was. And they said, well, what do we do to rectify this? And what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and gift of eternal life. You see, Thankfulness to God is more than just head knowledge. It's applying it to our life, and we have to respond. If you're not a Christian and you would like to respond out of thankfulness to God, if you would like to be baptized so that you can be forgiven of your sins, so that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that you can have God dwelling in your every single day life, we offer you that opportunity. But if you're a Christian and maybe you're struggling with a heart of thanksgiving, maybe you're struggling with not so much thanking God for what He does, but maybe you're struggling with thanking God for who He is. We're, we can relate. As a friend of mine says, I resemble that remark. We're here to help, but we don't know how to help if you don't tell us how. Whichever you need, whatever your need, please let us know by coming forward as we stand and sing this song.